All right, everybody, welcome back. This is instructor Phil Dimitriotis, and what we're going to be doing is we are taking a look at our third project for this class, which is our intermediate digital paint class. And this time, I'm giving you guys a lot of freedom where you're allowed to create and sort of act as a production designer, stage part of your own story, which I will walk you through and do a couple other demos for you later. But right now, what I want to really do is I want to talk about from our class blog. I want to go over uh, some basics about the story itself and how you should begin collecting your reference because I had a couple great questions already which were common from students. Some of you guys have never gone to this level of storytelling before where you're having to think about what it is you're going to draw. You have to match the brief which is right here and then your reference and all that other information. So I thought what I would do is I would show you how I work and how I start a particular project. Okay, so. First of all, assignment number three here is a, is a pathway and a journey, okay? So some of the great stories out there uh, that, are, that are told always involve a journey, okay? When I say pathway, I mean a way to get from point A to point B. That's why I call that. But it's pretty much a dedicated journey, okay? So one of the purposes of this course is to prepare you to tell stories using tonal values of black and white. Uh, this is a common practice in the entertainment industry as tone conveys mood, light, hierarchy, atmospheric perspective, and depth, okay, and enables the artist to stage stories quickly. Tone is also the foundation uh, for color, hence the old saying, color gets all the credit, but value does all the work, okay? So what does that mean? It means a lot of artists that work in our industry, whether they're in storyboarding, television animation, DVD production, feature animation, we work in tone a lot, even in game design. The reason why we work in tone is tone is quick and easy, it's easy to adjust, it shows mood and value, and it gives an overall feel to a particular location. That's why we work in tone. Um, I can do a tonal piece quicker than doing a color piece, and that's usually more common in production. Why? Because uh, if there's any changes that come down the pike, we're able to make those changes very efficiently using tone. It's not as easy to do that when you spend multiple hours working in color, okay? All right, um, and I mentioned in here, um, tone studies can be produced quickly, limiting production time and enabling and supporting the critique and revision process inside film production. I've been on productions where I've been asked, oh, go do a quick study of a forest, turn it back in so the storyboard artist can start boarding out their sequences. I do that, but I go back into it with a little bit of value to give it mood and a feel that helps them in their staging ability, okay? Happens all the time. Therefore, having the ability to work quickly and efficiently, telling stories, creating worlds, and simple tonal variations is of extreme importance. If you're planning on doing anything that involves visual storytelling and communication to an audience, you have to have this ability to work in tone, and that's exactly why I've crafted this assignment for you, okay? All right, so everything you do for the rest of your career, if it's used in animation, film, storyboarding, children book illustration, and the backbone of every pre-production development and production phase will involve working in tone. So take it seriously and create some outstanding work. Okay, your assignment brief. Create one or two characters, show them on a quest, displaying their pathway or journey to a location with three key shots. If you have two characters, they should be opposite in size from each other. For example, a gorilla, a little boy, or an elephant and a fox, or maybe a large robot and a small girl. You wanna have opposite size characters because they interact better with each other on part of their journey, okay? I actually might do the robot and little girl. I didn't put that example in there, but that's something that I've been doing in my sketchbooks a little bit as I like that sort of scenario. Okay, shot number one is an establishing shot usually of the characters beginning their journey. So what I'm showing you here is based off of most production level work that people are drawing up for a film or entertainment production, okay? And this brings us into the world of visual development. So what you guys are getting to do is sort of think about a particular style or approach on how you wanna work and tie that into your work with working in tone with your characters going through these three locations. So shot number one, establishing a shot. Shot number two, inside the middle of their journey, surrounded by elements. And I put that there because sometimes the second shot is also in storytelling, 
overcoming an obstacle. Remind me and I'll put that back in there in our class blog. So you're overcoming an obstacle and maybe the characters have to climb up part of a cliff that's really steep. Maybe they hit quicksand. Maybe they encounter a three-eyed giraffe beast that's trying to eat them really quick. You, I will allow you to interclude, interclude, to, in, to introduce and include, um, that was a combined words there, right? Interclude, right? I could put that in the Webster Dictionary, right? To introduce and include a third character, if it's part of your second shot, that would be totally acceptable, right? Shot number three is inside the location. Once they've encountered the problem or the story plot, when they're leaving the location. So they might be fleeing the location. They, the location could be on fire or, you know, they could be falling down like we'd seen in Indiana Jones where everything's falling apart and they've left the location, they're running through the forest and they're up on an edge looking back or maybe they're, you know, getting picked up by a helicopter or they've parachuted off something and they're looking away and the location is, you know, the, 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 the middle plot point of the story is resolving itself and they are no longer affected by it, okay? All right, so those are your three shots, okay? Um, pretty easy to do. That's how you want to think. You want to write that little verbiage down. So steps, and I'm going to cover some of these with you today. Number one, identify your characters and your story option, okay? Stay simple with your story option. If you come back to me and you say, well, I got this idea of uh, there's a necromancer and there's an old grandma and, and they have this turtle and they're going to go bring the ring of power to the turtle and, and the necromancer and it gets all overwhelming and confusing, guess what you've done? You've gone into left field, you left the simplicity of the project and you now created something that's totally overwhelming. This happens all the time in my classes and I call this left field where you go out in the left field of the ballpark and you're out there spinning your wheels somewhere and you're so far out there that nobody else gets caught up into all of that. Okay, you have to keep it sort of focused and down to earth, okay? Number two, lots of linear thumbnails. We're gonna talk about that. I'm gonna show you some of my approaches that I like to do in my linear thumbnail process, okay? Uh, you need to go through your designs, write down your three shots and start thinking of little ideas and combining your reference into other factual notes. That's what today's lecture is about. I'm going to show you my process, okay? Number three then, we pick our favorite thumbnails. Number four, we enlarge them, we clean them up, we add some light in there, we create atmosphere, okay? And then uh, number uh, after we do that, we set the mood, centered around supporting the story and the best composition of our characters, and then we light them and we render them out. That's our process. And I'm going to walk you through this process. I'm actually going to do some demos for you on this and try to be, this is an area I've been wanting to get into professionally because I'm always stuck doing environments. I've been doing some character work, but I've also been wanting to get much more. When I was a big idea, one of the cool things I got to do is we had a couple months to develop story plots and scenes with characters interacting in their environment. I loved it. That's basically early foundations of storytelling and visual development, getting the audience and indicating key shots for action scenes. That's absolutely fantastic. That's what you guys get to do. Okay, so first off, before we begin, our location is a ancient Mayan civilization or I put down a city in a forest. So what kind of city in a forest? I would prefer something a little bit older, but if you want to do futuristic in a forest, those do complement each other and it works pretty well. So I'm giving you those options. For today, I'm approaching the ancient Mayan civilization and I'm gonna go that route, okay? Those are your two location choices. And I know someone's gonna be like, well, you have to, if you have a city in the forest, you need to run it by me. Cause I don't want you to be like, well, I wanna do necromancers in an old ancient forest. No, uh-huh. Yeah with, the, yeah, with the turtle and the ring of power and, it's, and everything's in purple and I've had that happen before and it's a total nightmare. We don't want to go that way. First off, okay, this is, this is something, as in your instructor, I put up these demos for you right here, okay? They're really important demos. This is 17 years of my knowledge of gathering from working in animation and film and on concept and structuring environments, okay? So I'm going to click one here, open in another window, right? Takes you to my YouTube site. Here's a lecture on understanding one point perspective and why. Why do we use it? There are 
are definitive reasons that are extremely, extremely important. Okay, you need to watch that. Here, two point, you click this, right? Open up that window. Same lecture now talking about two point. Two point perspective has a lot to do with our second staging shot, okay? All right, absolutely. I cover all these points in here, okay? Right here, three point. I click this, I go over, open new tab and window. Bam! Here's a discussion about three point perspective and why we use it inside entertainment, okay? Look, I just gave you right there the gold on the cart. I mean, that's really breaks down all the fundamental basics of why you draw and set up scenes and what the emotional impact is behind those scenes. That right there is gold, and I don't know anybody else. I'm not tooting my own horn. I just love being a teacher, but I don't know anybody else at Cal State's universities or other programs that are, that are putting down lectures like that for their students to turn you into good visual storytellers, okay? Um, the only person I could think of is, to give credit where it's due, is Cliff Cramp at Cal State Fullerton. Talks a lot about vantage point and setting up angles and stuff like that. He does that. There's a couple other instructors that I've seen over there. And, of course, you will get that type of education at $160,000 per visit to Art Center College of Design because you're having instructors that are like me that come from the industry and they're talking about this in storytelling. So you have two options here. You can watch my lectures for free or you can go drop $160,000 and go learn it at Art Center, right? So any way you take it, it's what you put into it, okay? So first off, we have our reference. This is my buddy, Simon Rogers, who's over at DreamWorks. Outstanding artist. So one of the things, this is where I start Imagine I have an empty piece of eight and a half by 11 paper next to me right now. I start writing down little visual clues that I notice inside a particular environment. So I look through Simon's work, okay? And this, a lot of this is visual development he did for DreamWorks. So I look at this and I'm thinking to myself, man, look at the cross angles, the counter angles. Look at the size of the world in relationship to the characters, right? These are little things. So look, I'm going to, real quick, I don't have my little piece of paper here. Actually, I do. Sorry. I'm going to write down some little notes here to myself. So I just talked about scale of characters and world. Okay. Another thing I wrote down was cross and counter angle. Okay. That's something I noticed from looking at his work. So I go through some of this. Okay. That right there, that's one point perspective shot. It's an indicating something important is going to happen. All the characters are going to one particular path. They're moving down somewhere, okay? So I like to look at all these worlds. Look at the statues in there. Really cool, right? Hence uh, our Mayan world. See that? Mayan statues that exist that have been already been in a juggle environment. I'll show you that in a minute when I get to more to that level, okay? So, oops. So what I do is I always look at other artists. Why? Because the other artists that are out there, they're not just artists, they're problem solvers. They're really good concept artists like Sam Mitchlap and Simon Rogers here and John Navarez and a bunch of these other artists. They're what they are is problem solvers and they've already spent 10 years plus solving problems. The drawing, the Photoshop, all that, that's technique, okay? Above technique is understanding how to solve problems and how to be an efficient storyteller. And looking at all these scenes, look at here talking about angles and tilts, right? See how there's no verticals here? Everything is going to a particular angle. It implies a lot of action. There's a lot happening in there, okay? Look at the scale there, okay? So I'm writing down that word in here, angle tilts. Okay. I'm also noting down, I'm looking at this. I love that idea of characters in foreground. Okay, so a little note to myself. Another thing I've noticed in Simon's work, which is something we already taught you in this class, is already taught you about the importance of dedicated foreground, midground, and background. And here we are looking again. Here's foreground of the character. Midground is the city that's down there. And what's in the background? A bunch of rocks, right? So you could take, there's nothing wrong with this. You could take an image that Simon did or somebody else has done, and you could use that as a guide, a guide. You don't copy it. Use it as a guide to create your own staging based off of what they did. That's common. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? 
Have you ever seen that video on YouTube, Everything is a Remix? It means everything's copied from something else. Songs, sa sound, stories, Star Wars, all these stories. Everything that exists is something that's a remake and a remix of something else. That's basically what we're doing, okay? Now, these are three-point perspective down shots. When do you use that and get that question? Go watch my video. In fact, I'm going to get questions from students they are going to go, um, why would I use a three-point shot? Maybe in the escape scene, the area is on fire, it's fallen down. That's when you would use part of that shot. Go back and watch my perspective lecture. Okay? Travel, journey, size relationships. Okay? So lots of really cool stuff here from Simon, right? All this stuff is on the blog. There's 34 images here for you to look at. And hopefully you guys look at all this and you realize like, wow, look at what, you know, and this is, I'm sorry, this is Armand Serrano right here. Armand, another really, really talented guy, looking at the way he's staging, the way he's overlapping objects, you know, foreground, midground, and background, displaying characters in your world, okay, marking stuff up with tone, creating a sense of mood, okay, your characters in there. Now, I know I'm going to get somebody that's going to go, what if my two characters are on a journey and they encounter other characters they're meeting with? That's just fine. I have to approve it. If it's a room of necromancers, no, it ain't going to happen. If it's somebody else that makes sense and it really applies to the story and you were in the process of becoming a fantastic storyteller, absolutely, I encourage that. That's what I'm here for and that's what I want from you guys, right, is your teacher, okay, and fellow artist. I want you to become storytellers of tomorrow and then one day I get to go visit you and have a cup of coffee with you at a studio that makes me happy that floats my boat knowing that you have made it to that level and you're making you know fifteen to two thousand dollars a week fifteen hundred two thousand bucks a week and you're working on a story project spending all your time and effort thinking about composition ways to improve yourself and how to be really awesome at what you do okay all right so that's the reference I gathered for you okay so I'm going to minimize that window. We talked about our story. Here is step one for me. Okay. First thing we're going to do, first thing that I do is I go in and I start to gather reference. Okay. Now I gather reference in a couple different formats. I've already broken down what's important to me. Okay. I'm putting this on my notes and I'm going to give you all my notes at the end. So every one of you should be doing this. You should come back in here next class with a piece of paper that has your notes. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I have three areas I'm collecting work for. I have jungle reference, I have temple reference, and I have other art reference. So I'm going to open up jungle reference right now. I looked up Mayan jungle, and I'm going to look at this. I'm going to be like, man, what am I noticing here? Excuse me. I meant to say Amazon jungle, not Mayan jungle. Okay. So what am I noticing here? Look at the bendable thick trees. You see that? Okay, I'm going to make a little note. Bendable, thick trees. Okay, I'm also noticing a variety. Look at the, the leaves on here, this thick plant. And then there's some other thicker and thinner leaf plants. So I'm going to write that down. And the reason why I'm doing this, folks, is I've met some smart people in my life. I don't know anybody that's super duper duper smart that memorizes everything in their head. You can't do that. Human beings are usually good at remembering about seven things in a line. Once you get past seven, you forget them, so you have to make a list. That's why we have seven digit numbers. That's why we don't memorize eight digit numbers like you're in England or somewhere, because they're too hard to remember, right? Seven primes. One, threes, fives, and sevens always work, okay? So I'm looking at this. I got the thick and thin leaves. But look at this. Did you see this tree here? That's really important. That's a little piece of detail right there. That is a tree with what? With what? Yeah, but it's multiple, like, little branches. It's all one big, thick, giant tree. Do you notice that? That's really important to me. So that's a tree made from multiple smaller trees. Look at the reference, look into it. You know, you gotta sort of pay attention. Look at that. Right there I saw that and I thought, ooh, waterfront meets. Because in the Amazon there's lots of water. 
So what do we have? We have dedicated waterfronts, and that waterfront meets jungle canopy, okay? Jungle canopy can be easy to draw. It's just big, thick denseness of jungle around it, okay? And look at that little hut right there. See the little living area? So now I'm thinking, ooh, maybe there is Mayan villagers. They're, they have different classifications in all civilizations. So you could have a Mayan army in the ancient civilizations. There could be local people that live in these little huts. The huts, they're made out of, you know, both a combination of the environment, maybe stone, maybe also, you know, items that have been woven together, right? So I'm going to put down their waterfronts, meats, um, jungle, foliage, okay? And then I'm going to put down the huts and the living area. So that reference gave me that. Look at that. Ooh, look at those big, thief, thick, leafy plants there. See it? That's really, really important to me. Why? I could make a brush in Photoshop pretty easily, and I could make a whole selection of brushes that could paint this right here. In fact, I'm going to put a little note here on my little list here. Thick foliage brushes. Okay. The other thing that's important to me is look at the trees again. There's that vine I'm seeing, these thick viney trees that go up and they have secondary root structures that come off of them. That's really important to me. Also, what's important about this piece? Dedicated use of foreground to midground. Overlapping something in foreground, overlapping it into the midground really starts to make sense. Ooh, look at that. Isn't that a thing of beauty right there? Not So now what do I have? What if I had my characters walking through a little river? And then in the back now, that's what I saw when I saw this, was, wow, I could have griefy foliage on the side. I can have a river that's going through. What's something that's happening on that river from the light source? When am I getting this really cool effect right here? Reflection. So you nailed it, right? So boom, looking at this reference now gave me the idea of any canopy I have on the left side, if the light's coming from the right, I could have a really cool reflection in the water. I could show character two characters moving through that water on like different stones, sort of hopping around. And then in the back is maybe an elevated rise of a mountain with an old Mayan civilization on it, right? That would be an option. So this piece right here actually sets up part of my composition for one of my finished pieces. I could literally just look at this and draw from it. The other thing that's happening, look at foreground, midground, and background. Look at foreground here. Boom. Midground back here. Excuse me. Foreground, midground in here, and then the background sort of filtering through part of that. So if I erased part of this and put and drew a little Mayan civilization up there, I would have all of my elements. Characters moving through a piece, foreground, midground, background. I might add a couple more elements here in the foreground with a brush from work that I saw from here with these leaves. So right there, I almost have my whole answer to one of my environments right in front of me, okay? Now that's one of those still life airbrushed photo thingies, but you know what I mean? That make you want to go there. They like you put it as a screensaver, a little overdone. But what's something in that piece that I haven't thought about yet or mentioned? Waterfall. That's right. I'm writing that down right now. I could have a waterfall or waterfalls in my piece. In fact, what if I have an ancient civilization that builds its way up and there's waterfalls surrounding it. What color are waterfalls? White. So now I have white against black stone contrast. And it gets me to really look up in one particular location. The other thing that's cool is look at how the waterfall, what about this? What about the angled plane of that rock structure? Aha. I'm going to write that down. Angled plane of rock structure. Okay. This is how an upper echelon artist beats his competition, is what we're doing right now. This is the problem solving in the cognitive process of thinking about what's going to be in our world. And you know what? I have a student in my prop design class from last night who's a good kid, but he's a total knucklehead. And he came in. After I told them, what did I tell you guys to do, Ciro? Get what? Reference. And he comes in, and he shows me drawings, and I look at the drawings, and I go, you did those from your imagination. And I can tell because you ran out of options to put in there. Yeah, that's right. 
It's totally right. With no reference, you can't do certain things. You need the reference. Look at how invaluable my reference is to me right now, right? Look, I almost have a whole page here filled with little notes, okay? The other thing I'm going to put on here, so we talked about angle plane of rock structure. Notice the rocks in the river. Ooh, one of my jobs is a, is a art direction, excuse me, an art director, production designer, and just a good designer in general, is to embellish on my piece. Look at all the variation of rocks right there. So now I have also rocks combined with plant growth. That's key. That's another little element in my piece, okay? Look at that. What do we notice in there? What do you guys notice that's really cool? The vine tree stuff, that's right. In fact, look at this. See how the tree comes down? What happens when the tree gets down a little lower? It separates into this viney pattern of like root systems. In fact, look at this tree. Look at how it separates out. And then look at all these other cool, badass looking wormy like vines going everywhere. That's fantastic, right? There's a lot happening there, okay? All right, there. So that right there is my reference that I've gathered. And just to count it, we're only talking one, two, three, four, five, six images right now. So Paco had a great question, which was how many images should we be collecting? Well, that's six of there. Aha, how about now? Now I have a lot more. Why? This deals with detail. So what I need to know about Mayan structures. I need to understand how they're made. I need to understand how the blocks were put together, how the, the structures could rest upon themselves. What do the staircases look like? Hold on, I'm writing this down. Mayan structure. I need to think about the staircase. Okay. What about hierarchy? Do you notice that? Let me go over that term as we look at a couple more. Notice the hierarchy change. In fact, if you want to watch a really good movie that's somewhat haunting, haunting and some, somewhat scary, you ever seen the movie with... Uh, on the Mayan cultures, directed by uh, Apocalypto. yeah, Apocalypto, yeah, with Mel Gibson. Go watch that movie. That'll get your heart thumping. You see how the the upper echelon members of that society treated all the local villagers, they used them for sport and game and worship. In fact, part of the purpose of these temples was to go up there and to worship people, to the gods. That brought them closer to the gods. However, though, since we're working on an animated show. We're not going to be worshiping anybody or having any necromancers, right? Okay, so back to this. What do you notice about this structure? What I'm noticing right now, again, I mentioned last time was staircase. Look at the staircase, how it goes from wide to narrow very quickly, right? You see that? Look at the detail up here, very ornate. What about this right here? That is awesome, pure awesomeness. See that? So right there, something I know is that the Mayan culture has what? They have lots of statues. And they bring these statues into their world to make convincing environments. Okay? And not only statue work, what do you call this, folks? That's a stone relief. That's carving into stone that might represent a god, that might represent a story. These are other elements I could have. What if your character is walking through the forest and they're lost and they encounter this stone relief and there's like vines on it and they're looking at it like, what is this? What does this mean? Right? Now, that's an average face. What happens when we get into something like that? It might be a little bit scarier. Or we get into something like that. It's got water coming from the side. See what I'm getting at here? I can make a scary relief. I can embellish. It's one of my jobs to do. So let me go back a couple. So from that, and we look at this guy, very detailed. That might be a little bit too much too detailed for me, but what I catch in that is the guy, the warrior, his suit, his bracelets, the decorative outfit that he has on. That's something I could do that I can embellish off of. Look at that structure. Isn't that pretty cool? I, what I really like, what do you notice in that piece? I noticed the, 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 the rocks, the, like the paver stones that lead up. So I'm going to put that down on my little note here. 
I have the paver stones that lead me to the environment. The environment raises. There's actually one set of stairs, another set of stairs, and we go inside. Okay, there's some other monuments around it on the side. That one again, look at stairs. So we have a, a courtyard area, okay? So that's something that I'm noticing now. It's becoming normal in their architecture. They have a courtyarded area, and then you go up. So it's almost like a waiting area that you're in first, and then you go up to this temple of some form, okay? Ooh, courtyard with jungle leaves and trees overgrowing all of it, and then there's cool vines everywhere, and then we get to the magic temple. Okay, what about that? What do you notice in that? Look at the height. Look at how tall that is above the forest. That monument temple is so tall, it's actually reaching over the canopy. Aha, I could have something like that that's very steep with stairs. Maybe that's where a really important artifact or item is kept in part of my story talked about that the nice relief work the cool sculpture work there and you know what's so cool about this part of this assignment you guys are getting to design a production right can you see the relationship to its its cousin which is theme park design right next door can you imagine a ride like montezuma's revenge and wading through and in the beginning part of the line there's a whole division at disney that's called Imagineering that does just this. They build and they, they develop and do everything that's related to their theme park designs. What, can you tell me really quick, what is the scenario and the relationship between Imagineering and what we're talking about right now? If you're working for Disney Imagineering as an artist and designer, you're responsible for working on all of their rides, their gift stores, their restaurants. What does Disney have in every single What's the common thing in every gift store, ride, restaurant? What is it, folks? It's a word. Theme. Dedicated themes that change. You have a jungle theme. You might have a Mayan theme. You might have a Louisiana theme. You have all these different themes that are changing that reflect upon part of the architecture and the structure, right? Okay. Ooh, look at that. That's a winner right there. That looks like one of your skulls, Ciro, that you just drew the other night, doesn't it? That's a Mayan sculpture. Isn't that pretty cool? Very stylized. That's awesome. Oh, look at that. There's the queen bee up there. They're carrying her around. Guys with a bunch of torches. I'm not saying you have to draw a bunch of characters like that, but it gets me to think about, look at the low angle staging of where the horizon line is in relationship to that structure. That right there, take out the people and if I were to pull my frame out of that and draw around that, that's one of my shots again, isn't it? Low angle shot to that high elevated building that's actually going into a three point perspective because the, the horizon line's low, okay? So that right there is two shots I've now given you, which by the way, if you give me your thumb drives, I'll give you all my reference, okay? That I have already collected, you can use that, gather your own. Okay, look at the thickness here on that walkway. It doesn't go thick to thin anymore. It's really, really thick. Right? Fantastic. Look at that sculpture right there. Pretty cool, right? Look at the ear loop things where they expand the ears. Ouch. So then I get into artwork. What I like to do is after I have my reference and my architecture, I, go, I like to go look at other artists. And what I like to do is sit down and write notes on what they're doing for staging. What's important about this piece of art? What did they do? Hold on a minute. I, I accidentally put that in the wrong file. Let me go through my, my no, normal reference. Here's some other cool statue reference. There's some other parts, Mayan artifacts and, and relics inside surrounded by, okay? Look at that. Another beautiful low angle shot. Ooh, look at those heads. Look at the pattern work in there. That's a beautiful reference right there. Really important, okay? Look at that. Look at the, the variations of how you go up this, and then you sort of go up, and then you go up again. Look at how high you are in relation to the canopy. That's key right there, that's huge. I would take that picture, that right there is another staging element for me to look at. 
great reference. Okay? What about that? What about, what if there's an earthquake and there's stuff and block tumbled over and we're trying to get to the magic rock of Zara or whatever, right? And there's all this rock and tumbled location and then in the middle of that is one structure still left that could be where our characters are going. So they could be climbing over all this rock. The one thing I don't have in here is I don't have any dedicated scale. You can decide that. You can decide maybe those boulders are ginormous, maybe they're small. So what do I do? I come over to my piece of paper, I write down uh, earthquake, rock field on there, okay? So that's pretty cool. Look at that. Talk about going over the jungle canopy. What if you're up on a hill and then you're looking across and there's this giant structure that just comes out of the, the mountain canopy? Or what if there was a giant concaved, like we went down a hill into like a huge gully and then you have this giant structure hidden in the tree canopies, but it drops really you know, down low. That's playing with elevations. Oh, let me write that down. Playing with elevation control. That's always key. Cover that in interior design. One of the first things I talk about. Better designs are on different elevations, all right? Here's all my awesome reference. I close that file. Let me come back here and was the one image that was an illustration? Where'd you go? There. So now I come back. Then my next file right here is art. So this is from other artists. I want to look at what they've done and I want to see what works. So real quick, before I begin, I'm going to read my sheet of paper. This is why I keep notes, okay? This is what I, in, this is what I have so far, and even though I scribbled it down super quick, okay? I have separation of reference from jungle to temple to art. I have giant thick trees that go from thick to thin. I have thick and thin leaf patterns, okay? I have trees with multiple smaller trees making up the root systems, okay? I have waterfront meets jungle foliage, okay? I have, I have the word huts or living area along the jungle river, okay? I have thick foliage and brush, waterfalls, angled plains of rock and structure, rocks in a river, rocks combined with thick plant leaf and growing trees on them. See what I have right there? Okay. I already have 15 different cues on how to stage my environments just from looking at my reference. Now I'm looking at other artists. So now I'm gonna write up another page. Number one, first thing I notice in there is what? Foreground, midground, and background. What is the background? It's literally a lightly painted element of trees, very, very light, of just trees and moss on a hill. Do you see that? Real simple. So all I really have to do is produce, here's a little golden secret I'll show you when we go to paint. All I have to do is produce a realistic foreground and then overlap the foreground on a rough midground on a really diluted background and it works. That piece works right there. That's a great element, okay? I found this artist's work, and I'm not gonna be able to probably scroll through them. What I liked was the stylization and simplicity of the work. Yeah, I, I can't go up and down, unfortunately, but if I zoom out, give me a minute here. Try to go full screen with it, come on. Well, that's about as full screen as we get. Anyway, um, I really liked the stylization in here. And if I minimize it, it's some of the ones I liked were up here. I'd have to go into Photoshop and zoom into there. There's some great reference. Try that again. There we go. Oh, cool. Look at that. Look at the tree branches. Look at the thick and thin leaves. Look at the rock. So I'm writing this stuff down. Tree branches, overlapping shapes, uh, rocks with moss on them. Writing all this stuff down. Where? On my piece of paper. You can't memorize this stuff. This is the small percentages that make you a better artist and designer than the rest of your competition, right? Look at that. That's gorgeous. Very stylized. This is beautiful in here. Oh, look at that. Light rays. Bingo. Write that right down. 
light rays coming through leaves. That happens in jungles and forests. That might be the setup of another shot, okay? All really, really beautiful work. So I look at this reference to help promote me forward. And by the way, this is Simon's stuff. Somebody had already put it together on Pinterest and I saw it, right? All put together, okay? A couple there we didn't see before. Look at that shadow, okay? So Simon's work we looked at again. Look at that. Isn't that a neat shot? What's happening there? The artist is playing up scale. Gives me a great idea then. What if I show a hill here in the foreground, a little statue of like a mummy skull thing or whatever, a bunch of skulls stacked on top of each other, characters walking into this, and there's old structures around them with jungle on it, and then going in three point, going up behind them is this giant structure that goes all the way into the clouds, piercing the clouds with clouds around it with a light on at the very top, and my characters have to walk all the way up there to go find the magic power stone ring or whatever they're looking for, right? You see that? The, the, the necromancer cure, right? Whatever it might be, right? But you get the point, right? Is that this image somebody else did, so this is the way I like to work. I have those three folders. I have my jungle reference, I have my temple reference, and then I have other art reference. Because everybody else is going to give me a new idea. Look at this. What do I get? What idea do I get here, folks? What do you see that's really cool? Vertical format. Give me a vertical composition. You could show characters starting down from real rough jungle, getting into less jungle, passing a waterfall, and in the very background is the place they're going. That could be your second shot of them zigzagging their way up to their location, right? On a vertical format. That would totally work. Okay? Look at that. I really like that a lot. You know why? It's very simple and easy. Students tend to overcomplicate projects. Look at the simple, easy read of the foreground elements. Look at what's in the midground. Look at what's in the background. These right here, folks, are just trees, and that is a copy and paste of other trees in the back, tilted, with a simple brush that just, that's actually one of the stock brushes in Photoshop that just has a jitter control on it that creates this little brush pattern. That's more stylistic. That's totally acceptable. Doesn't that sort of look like old Jungle Book too? Right? Totally acceptable. That's why I was telling you guys in the advanced digital paint could do this project. It ties into what you're doing stylistic wise. And you could copy off the story if you wanted to. Okay, look at that. What do I like about that and not like about that? Well, um, this looks like water. I'm confused but it's actually water that drops off and drops down. I thought that was a reflection at first of pillars, but it's not, and there's some type of temple. The only thing I don't like about the temple is I don't like these tall vertical items on here. It pulls me away from part of the architecture. Part of the architecture had rounded vertical big blocky shapes. They didn't have these sharp needle shapes, okay? It's a nice piece though. Simple foreground, look at the midground. Background's just rough forest, right? Ooh, that is gorgeous, isn't it? What do we have there? We talked about those elements earlier. Does anyone remember those elements? We talked about rocks with plants on them. We talked about waterfalls. We talked about an, a Mayan structure that's old with an entrance. It's surrounded by the environment, looking at Simon's work, right? Always surrounded by everything around you. Makes the story, makes the, the characters feel small like they're trying to overcome obstacles, that creates an ethos in your work, okay? Ethos is a dedicated, it's a Greek word, ethos and pathos, okay? Ethos is your feeling you're getting for that. Do you feel empathy? Do you feel sorrow? Do you feel lost? Do you feel restricted, okay? The pathos is the other side in Greek, which is how are you taking us there? What is the story? So we have, we have, dual actually emotional contents coming out, right? One is from the environment surrounding us, making us feel belittled or lost or empathy with color. The other one is they're on a journey. Where is it they're going to? How are they getting there? What are their obstacles, right? All those come together. Look at that, isn't that gorgeous piece? The scale, the waterfall. Look at the simple, look at the overlap of foreground here to midground and then overlap of back elements. Really fantastic composition. Simple, easy, 
and then much more stylized. I wish Michelle was here because that looks like something Michelle C. would do. Okay, she likes that type of fun style. What's really cool that really caught my eye on this is these canopies. They're treating them like round, fluffy umbrellas cut open. You see that? That makes them look three-dimensional. Great solution to coming up with your foliage right here. And again, look at foreground, midground, up here into the background, right? Really fantastic, really, very, really quite nice. And then look at the light coming through in terms of color. Lights coming down there. And those of you in the advanced painting class, we were just talking about this, right? Look at the local color of the trees here. Look at the local color here. That green has a lot more yellow into it. Why? It's exposing the midground where the light's coming down. So you have the yellow tint of the light affecting the green local color. So you get a yellow green here, right? Here you don't really have a lot of yellow green, a little bit, but it's in shadow. It's a darker value set, okay? We're not working in color for the intermediate class, but we are talking about our just base values and we are still thinking about light, okay? That one was sort of cool. That one's pretty cool. I like the, the tree in there. I like some of the, the elements. I just felt like I'm really close. I lose a lot of what's in the background, but it's a nice piece, you know? And then we start off there again, back to that one, okay? So look at that right there, total. I have, you know, all that reference, okay? So what have I done right now? Sorry, I didn't mean to make this go so long, but 40 minute lecture, which to me is probably one of the most important lectures I've ever given anybody, which is not about technique, it's not about drawing, it's how to start. This right here is worth its weight in gold because I have my reference identified. I have my subject matter and art architecture identified. I have other artists and styles identified. And most important, I've written down and left with a whole eight and a half by 11 little piece of paper right here of ideas. And that gives me a starting point. That is the difference between a Yahoo student who comes in, doesn't gather reference and goes, well, I'm just gonna do a drawing and my first drawing is gonna be my answer. It's never that way. Okay, because people at that upper echelon, the same thing in athletics, we carve off percentages. We run stairs. Well, that makes me 3% better sprinter, okay? Um, I did some burpees, you know, where you jump down and up and whatever you're working out. That builds up your, your tolerance a little bit more. That adds another 2%, okay? The fact we thought about our background foliage or foliage meets water, that gives me a couple percent more. So all those little things add up to 15 or 20% that make your piece better than your competition. And that is the one thing as an instructor that I tell you that allowed myself to try to get better. As I was always thinking of, hey, I'm not gonna cram this piece out and get it done with because I need to go to lunch or I have a date or I wanna go eat sushi and I'm in a hurry. I'm gonna spend a little bit more time and narrow down those little percentages and come up with my ideas on paper because they're gonna make my work 10, 15, 17, 19, or 20% stronger than the rest of my competition. And that's the answer to part of your, you know, your goal as an artist, is to be that stronger individual. Anyway, from here, now it's into thumbnails. And real quick, before I go, I'm gonna show you thumbnails. You thought we were done, huh? Okay, linear thumbnails. So you were talking about Phil's work. How does Phil work? Well, this is something that I do right here. Boom, linear thumbnails. Okay, sometimes I have tone, sometimes I don't have tone. Sometimes they're just rough line like this. Okay, sorry, this is a little bit dulled down. But sometimes they're just ballpoint pen like this. Sometimes I separate foreground, midground, to background. Those are my thumbnails, okay? That's the first thing I do is I start working on thumbnails. The next thing I do is I come back and I start thinking about and considering what are my silhouette shapes that are existing inside my environment. That's key to me because now I could start making brushes. So I can, I can go along and look at my reference and think about those plants in the front. And I think about what do the rocks look like. By the way, every one of these little comps right here were created from these little thumbnail studies. You see that? That's the importance of me doing that. Thinking about, well, what kind of rocks do I have? What are the structure? What do the rocks look like that were used to build the Mayan temples? What do the trees, the plants look like? What do the reflections in the water look like? 
all these little elements all come together, right? I create all these little pages. These little pages, by the way, the original prints are inside that little room. I can pull them out. We talked about, Frank and I talked about putting up stuff up around the, the top of this room. This is my thinking process. This identifies, even my clouds here, this solves a ton of problems for me, okay? Then after this, it's in the thumbnail land. Boom. I start creating thumbnails in my location. Sometimes I do them as little gradients, but I've already done linear thumbnails. Now I'm going on top of my ideas and I'm using tone and light. Voila. I'm taking my thumbnails to the next step, okay? So when I come back here and I look at other artists like this, that's a linear thumbnail with really simple markers, 60, 40, 20. That's it. Three markers. That's all you need to do. You shouldn't be doing any rendering. You should be thinking about foreground, midground, background. That's it. Linear thumbnails. Okay. Here's another artist. Had some really good stuff. But these are much more along the shape language that we were doing before. This is not what you do. This is not a linear thumbnail. This is a tonal thumbnail with light in it that we're building towards. We can't get to this type of beautiful designing until we've spent the time to understand what are the shapes, what is Mayan temples look like, what do the rocks look like, okay? You get that information in, and then we go to tone, and then everything starts to make sense, and everything comes together, okay? So I just grab these up. Now, these are acceptable. These are linear thumbnails done digitally with 60, 40, 20 marker grade put in. That's it. If you want to do these, I'm totally fine with it. So if you want to leave dark against light, dark against light, dark against light. Look at that. See how easy they are? These are stepping stones for you. They're not finished drawings. They're rough little sketches. that You can combine these. You can take this, put it on the side here. Okay, I just found this work on Pinterest. It's beautiful. It's great, simple, easy ideas. There's not a ton of rendering. We're not going in there and rendering the back of the teeth. We're rendering this. This is simple, easy reads to figure out our staging. So when I'm looking at your thumbnails and your linear thumbnails, that's why I call them linear, line with values, there should be no rendering happening right now. You should be just thinking out and blocking out staging of your characters and your story. Okay. Next demo I'm going to do for you probably be partly over the weekend and into Tuesday, where I'm going to show you my thumbnails that I'm doing for this project, how I'm getting there and how I'm organizing them and thinking about the interaction of my characters and their relationship to the world. Okay, that'll be next phase. All right, so look at that. That's easy, simple. This guy, talented guy, beautiful. Simple and easy. Remember, simplicity is the best answer. Found some other thumbnails there. Those are great thumbnails where you're just taking a pen and maybe darkening foreground. That's it. Simple, easy. That's the starting phase. And mark my words on this. When you go get a job, and some of you guys get freelance, you come back and talk to me, and I read your contract or talk about giving you some pointers like I'm doing with Ryan and I've done with a bunch of other students, right? One of the things we're going to talk about is you showing your client your ability to de design and your ability to work in this subject matter, which is linear thumbnails, well, excuse me, let me back up. It is understanding your reference. I have reference of arc. What did, what did conclusion from today to wrap this up? I showed you Mayan architecture reference. I showed you other artists reference. Okay. I showed you statue reference that was more specific. Okay. Now you're going to produce linear thumbnails. I showed you how, how I go in and, and figure out the shapes that exist inside the location. What's the, the shape language? We talked about plants. We talked about trees. We talked about different types of plants inside our environment, right? All these little things go into here and also support. So when I work for a client, I'm sending them my thumbnails, my reference pages, everything all together. And you know what they always come back? They always come back to me and they go, wow, Phil, you sent us more than like anybody on the whole entire production has shown. That means you care. And I do care because I care about my name and my reputation to build the best visual story for my client. And that's why all these years later, 17 years later, I'm a full-time teacher and I have a job teaching now, but I still get calls all the time for freelance. Some of them I take, some of them I say no to. It depends what my schedule's like. That's a cool availability. And part of that, we talked about that earlier today, 
your reputation precedes yourself. And so I have a reputation of caring about my clients, finishing the work, giving the best work possible, thinking about all these little things. Did I just come into class and wing my sketch of a helmet because I didn't know I was too lazy to go gather reference? No. Was I too lazy to put this presentation together for you? No. Was I too lazy to think about and make my little piece of paper here to look at with all my terms on there? No. I'm not lazy at all, except on Sundays after I have haagen or something, right? Then I get lazy. Or if I eat a large Greek meal and I have to go take a siesta, that's what everybody does in Greece. They shut down the whole country for two hours and everyone goes home. They do the same thing in Spain too. And everyone goes home and takes a nap. We should have that here in the States, but we don't. Anyway, back to this, right? Don't be lazy. Get all your P's and Q's lined up. I am getting a little frustrated this semester because I have students that are skipping the thumbnail phase. I have students that are skipping the reference phase and they don't see a value in it. I was talking to Mike Sheehan the other day and we were thinking about starting our own little posse here where we track you down and beat you up in the parking lot with Nerf bats because you're too lazy to gather the reference you need to be successful. This is the pillar and the foundation that makes you successful as an artist. Learn it now, because guess what? Everybody at Art Center is doing this, and you're competing against them, okay? And if you're around the right people, there are lots of lazy people at Cal States and universities, UCI, UCR, all these other schools that don't want to do this, and they're lazy. And where does lazy get you? Bad design work, okay? Keep drawing, have fun, talk to you soon.